What is up y'all? I am back with a Science Simplified for you guys. So excited. Um, I haven't made a Science Simplified in a while and they're really fun for me. <laughs> and I read these two papers last week that I was like, okay, I need to make a video on these. I got sick last week so I couldn't make it, but I am back with a new video on this. So I'm gonna do one to kind of go over the science and then also a second one to kind of go over the application. Because as we know, just because there's a science, there's a study to show it doesn't necessarily mean that it might work in a certain setting or a certain situation or whatever, right? So I kind of like to do both, as you guys might have known from um, my previous Science of the Five videos. And if you haven't watched those, definitely suggest going and check those out because those are really good papers as well. So the paper in question, I guess review, um, is the Matador study, which was pretty popular <laughs> um, in science circles. <laughs> well, popular, you know. That's definitely your quotes. Um, and MATADOR is an acronym that stands for Minimizing Adaptive Thermogenesis and Deactivating Obesity Rebound. So essentially, you know, weight regain, weight loss, like looking at different types of dieting behaviors, right? Super cool, right up my alley. Um, this was definitely the first study to be super well controlled looking at, um, you know, like a diet break in general and just non-continuous kind of feeding for calories. So I started reading this and then I actually stopped and then I started reading this one um, because it was a review on the topic that they actually recommended um, and the interesting thing with the review was that the studies that they picked were like really not that good not gonna lie I was definitely expecting a lot more um, or better quality studies um, but they just were not that great as far as the how controlled they were so the Matador study which we're gonna go over is very well controlled like, amazingly this one like the, the ones that they chose from not so much um but in general they were looking the review was essentially looking at intermittent energy restriction ier or continuous energy restriction just continual eating the same amount per day but pretty much when they said intermittent energy restriction what most of the studies did um was they didn't really have strict parameters on like what to eat or what not to eat it was just like oh fasting for a certain amount of time eating less on a certain days and then eating ad libitum which means eating whatever you want for the other days which kind of blows my mind for like a dieting study. Um, and I would not consider this intermittent fasting at all. Like they didn't have certain hours that they had to eat. They didn't have all these, this is very open-ended. Um, and they kind of refer to this as intermittent fasting, which I definitely would not recommend that because that's generally not how people think of intermittent fasting. Um, so if you do read this paper and you see that, you're like, mm, that's, that's what they mean. Um, it's just basically not continuous every single day. Um, so they did choose they did find 40 studies um, that fit within their parameters. Um, 32 of them were independent clinical trials. And then within that, there was 12 that compared um, the intermittent energy restriction to continuous energy restriction. Uh, there was eight that compared just the effectiveness of IER to a control, so no other diet. And then there was 20 that looked at just the IER, so intermittent energy restriction. Um, so just knowing that when you are reading it is important, um, but it was, it again, wasn't like as good as the Matador study. <laughs> and basically what I, um, there's a bunch of stuff on there, which honestly I would highly suggest you guys to go read if you want, um, but it's not as important as the other one. But the conclusion is that basically there were similar results depending on how you wanted to eat, um, continuous energy restriction or intermittently. Um, the one question that they had was, does the intermittent dieting possibly ward off some of the adaptations um, that dieting creates, because dieting does create adaptations for everybody. And based on the, the review, it did not. But again, like I said, the studies in question were not necessarily um, the best, and they even did speculate that's likely because um, when they were off their fasting, they might not have gone back to maintenance calories properly. Like there just wasn't any control there. So they weren't really sure why, um, but they did want to dig a little bit deeper, which is why they decided to do the Matador study. Okay, so going over my notes for the Matador study, which I think was so well designed, like I cannot get over how well designed the study was. <laughs> Normally I read studies and I'm like, oh, this could have been a little better, um, but this one was a one y'all like pff, they must have had major funding uh and you'll see why but so like i said before matador stands for minimizing adaptive thermogenesis and deactivating obesity rebound um so basically adaptive thermogenesis is when so when you're dieting your ree goes down right 
and that can re use resting energy expenditure and that is a whole bunch of different things that isn't your metabolism that's your neat that's your um activity levels that's like like as far as like how many calories you burn during activity um how you digest food like there's so many thermic effect of food there's so many layers to it but oftentimes it decreases more than expected um and that's called adaptive thermogenesis so basically like if you're dieting and you should your RE should drop about this much, they find a lot of times in the research that it actually drops more. So this has been coined in the literature as adaptive thermogenesis. There's a lot of really good papers um, from Liebel and Rosenbaum. Highly suggest reading their stuff if you're interested in adaptive thermogenesis. Um, so really the key question of the researchers was, is there a way that we can attenuate this adaptation? Um, and that way we can improve weight loss and weight maintenance. So like, best question ever, right? Well. If you're a nerd, it is. <laughs> um, so the design, like a like nerd boner over this design. They had a four week baseline, so they were very weight stable. Um, they understood the appropriate calories. If they lost or gained weight, they made changes. They weighed themselves daily, like it was really good data. Um, and then they had 16 weeks of energy restriction. So there was two groups. One group, the CON group, if you're reading it, will have continuous diet. So just 16 weeks straight diet. The INT group with the intermittent group has would diet in two week blocks so they would have eight two week blocks and then seven two week maintenance periods so they would diet for two weeks maintenance two weeks diet two weeks maintenance two weeks so theirs ended up being 30 weeks total but it was the same amount of energy restriction um they also then followed up um afterwards for eight weeks kind of like a maintenance kind of phase and then a six month post follow-up afterwards like, this is a researcher's dream to be able to do this, you guys. Like, not kidding. Um, so subjects, 25 to 50 year old males, um, they were obese, so over 30 BMI. Um, they were sedentary, um, which was categorized as less than 60 minutes of vigorous activity a week. So pretty sedentary, overweight men. Um, 36 of them finished. There was 19 in the continuous group, 17 in the INT group. So pretty even split. Um, and so the restriction was they were eating at 67% of maintenance, so a 33% calorie reduction. Um, and the cool thing about this was um, their REE was measured every four weeks. So um, as that went down, they adjusted their calories. So they were in the same relative energy deficit the entire time. So that's really the biggest issue with a lot of research with dieting stuff is you don't if you're not making changes um to match kind of you know what's going on in somebody's body um like we would in like the real world like let's say with like coaching or something right like every week i'm checking in with people maybe we don't change things but maybe we do um so it's really cool that they adjusted for that and they actually made changes now diet this is this is the money part um they were provided with a baseline diet um so pretty much like most of their food was prepared for um in a like regulated kitchen the meal plan was like from an rd they had it the food made and delivered to their house like meal prep service 101 um and then they also had a few provisional additions um which were approved and basically there is previous research to show that like if people had autonomy over a few things which we know as well like in real life if you basically like you're like okay i'm gonna eat my stable foods and then there's a few things that i really like personally that i'm gonna put in they were more likely to stick to the plan. So again, super, super cool. The macro breakdown um, was not perfect, but this is definitely better for, um, you know, average population, better than they were doing. Um, 25 to 30% fat, 15 to 20% protein, 50 to 60% carbs. Obviously, I think that's a little carb heavy, low in the protein for somebody who's not exercising, but this is still a calorie restriction, which is why they saw results. All right, so the results, dun, 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 super cool. <laughs> I'm just so excited about this. There was a greater weight loss in the intermittent group. There was greater fat loss in the intermittent group. There was no significant differences between the groups for fat-free mass, meaning drops in fat-free mass. Um, the REE reduction had no significant differences between the groups. Um, and when adjusting for the, the body comp for the reductions in their REE, um, there was significantly smaller changes with the intermittent group. So honestly, all around they saw better results even though it took longer but here's like the kicker so when they did the maintenance phases um, their weight changed zero plus or minus 0 0.3 kilograms like that's pretty good right like 
the fact that the first number is zero is is really awesome. So they it was true maintenance, which is what the researchers were after. Um, and then afterwards, they did like an eight week post period, kind of like a weight stable period. Um, and the weight, the INT group was weight stable um, pretty much the whole eight weeks afterwards. Um, the continuous group, the first two weeks, um, wasn't really money changes, but then there were significant increases um, at weeks four and week eight. So they had regained some of the weight. Um, wasn't much, but it was still significant compared to the INT group. Um, and, and then at six months post, it did vary a lot, which is totally understandable. Um, but total weight lost from the end of baseline remained greater in the INT group. Um, so it was still pretty positive as far as how much of the weight they lost they didn't regain which is honestly the biggest thing like everybody can lose weight but how many people can maintain their weight lost um so greater weight loss was attributed to greater weight loss during the diet blocks not because of the longer diet so they really wanted to make sure that people knew that the maintenance periods were true maintenance like they were not basically because the one group was only 16 weeks and then the other group was 30. So I was like, oh, well they spent longer time in a deficit. They did not lose weight in the maintenance periods. Like they were at true maintenance. Um, so honestly, that's pretty fucking cool and really hard to, um, you know, monitor. But like I said, if you have all your food delivered and you're pretty much just executing, it's really kind of speaks to what I see a lot with, you know, myself and my clients. Like when you have a plan, you're just doing it. You can maintain fairly well. Um, and then the um, energy breaks um, were really critical to the su success of the subjects. Um, and it wasn't just ad libitum feeding. Like I mentioned the review, that's kind of why I wanted to bring that review up. Um, because while it is a good review of like what's out there, it doesn't really do a good job at like real life, like tracking like food um, and just real life in general. Like, are you trying to see changes or not? Like if you just tell people to like go ad libitum eat, they you're going to see all kind of crazy responses. Some people are going to eat less because they're on a diet. Some people are going to eat way more because they're hungry. I mean, like, so you have to really regulate it. Um, so the REE seemed to be preserved um, during energy restriction in the intermittent group. Um, without compromising weight lost, um, which was pretty much the biggest question, like does this affect uh, weight loss, weight regain? Um, is there a way to kind of hack dieting per se? Um, and yeah, there are definitely very small differences uh, as far as like if you're looking at it like numerically, even the, during the diet and especially in the post diet, but it is still significant. And in a study that's about 36 people, significance can be hard to reach. So. Overall, like I said, this is probably the coolest um, long-term study I've seen in a while as far as dieting goes. Um, now, practical implications. <laughs> definitely want to talk about that in the part two because I don't know about you guys, but I definitely don't want to be dieting for two weeks and then off for two weeks and then dieting for two weeks to off. It just sounds crazy to me. But it does speak to the fact that having these periods of maintenance controlled um, might be super beneficial, which is kind of what people have been doing anyways. Shout out to Eric Helms um, for kind of starting diet breaks uh, in the physique community. But this paper really, really did a good job at kind of outlining it. So if you're interested, I will link up the study um, citation below so you guys can research it. And yeah, happy nerding out. Uh, I'm happy to be back with Science Simplified and I already have my next paper um, that I have an eye on to do this for. So excited about that and stay tuned for part two uh, for kind of the application to this research, right? So all these positive benefits, it seems like from this diet break, what does that mean in the real world? So thank you guys for watching and stay tuned for part two.